If you've ever been in a bar at closing time, you know it can often be a moment tinged with a little sadness. But on January 16th, 1920, closing time was met by millions of Americans from coast to coast with downright despair. For all they knew, it was the final closing time in America. For the next day, January 17th, 1920, all the bars and saloons across America were closed for what appeared to be for good. Something called Prohibition had begun. You are listening to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more... Your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. That all men and women are created equal. Give me liberty or give me death. Nobody's free until everybody's free. The government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. History matters because it's not just about the past. History's about us, here and now. It explains the world we live in and why things are the way they are. And history gives us insights into how to achieve a more just, peaceful, and prosperous future. So people, let's do this. Greetings one and all. Thanks for tuning into In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. I'm host Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, and this is In the Past Lane, episode number three. We come to you this week from the incomparable Al Capone Studios, located somewhere outside of Boston, Massachusetts. You can learn more about me, this podcast, and our guests at our website, inthepastlane.com, and on Facebook and Twitter, where I tweet as In the Past Lane. Pushing all the right buttons and issuing all the right commands is our exceptional executive producer, Lulu Spencer. Couldn't do it without you, Lulu. Lulu? Lulu? Are you talking to me? Uh, yeah, but never mind. Okay, moving along. This week at In the Past Lane, our theme is prohibition. Or, to be more precise, prohibitions, as in plural. Here's the lineup. First, we'll start off with a think piece about the problem of personal freedom in American history. On the one hand, Americans have always revered personal freedom. But on the other hand, those same Americans frequently have supported movements aimed at restricting certain kinds of personal freedoms. The example we'll look at today is a little-known prohibitionist movement that sought to ban cigarettes in the early 20th century. Next, we'll talk to historian Lisa McGurr about her new book, The War on Alcohol, Prohibition and the Rise of the American State. Trust me, it's about a lot more than jazz and speakeasies. In our final segment, it's time for Mercy Street Rewind. That's the feature where I bring in In the Past Lane's senior historical correspondent, Megan Kate Nelson, to get her insightful analysis and commentary on the latest episode of the PBS historical drama, Mercy Street. But since we want to avoid dropping any spoilers on those of you who haven't yet watched the show, our Mercy Street Rewind feature will appear as a separate segment in this podcast feed. Okay, people, check your mirrors. Your journey in the past lane begins now. In the Past Lane is brought to you by the Electoral College, deciding presidential elections since 1789. We know, it's undemocratic. It makes no f-ing sense. But hey, it's in the Constitution. The Electoral College. Why stop now? Freedom. If there's one thing most Americans agree on, it's that their nation is committed to freedom. Freedom of speech and association. Freedom of choice, of movement. Freedom to choose one's career, or who to marry, or the freedom not to marry. And lately, at least in some states, this freedom now extends to the use of marijuana. The list goes on and on. So there's no question that Americans love freedom. And they love the notion that they live in the land of the free, as the national anthem proclaims. And most Americans also share a sense that this freedom needs protection. 
Just consider how many cars in the U.S. today feature bumper stickers announcing, freedom isn't free. But here's the thing. Throughout the history of the United States, freedom-loving Americans have waged countless campaigns aimed at curbing freedom. That is, efforts to compel people to stop engaging in particular behaviors or expressing certain ideas. Now, this tradition starts way back in the early 17th century, when Puritan leaders in Massachusetts Bay Colony demanded religious conformity. Anyone who ran afoul of this law, think Roger Williams or Anne Hutchinson, they were expelled from the colony. Actually, they were the lucky ones. Some heretics, like the Quaker Mary Dyer, they were hanged on Boston Common. Over the next 300 years, Americans waged prohibitionist campaigns against other things, like alcohol, narcotics, prostitution, polygamy, child labor, and communism. And that's just to name a few. These prohibitionist campaigns reveal a key fact of American history, that while Americans profess a love of freedom, they've always been quite willing to restrict it, usually in the name of maintaining order or preserving morality. Now, this doesn't mean that Americans are hypocrites. But it does mean that while it's true to say that freedom isn't free, it's also true that freedom is complicated, very complicated. Freedom has many dimensions, most notably freedom to and freedom from, as in freedom to speak your mind, but also freedom from personal harm. And these freedoms often collide. One man's freedom to shout fire in a crowded theater collides with other people's right to be free from injury even death, resulting from a panicked theater crowd. Yeah, freedom is complicated. Well, with these ideas in mind, let's take a closer look at two prohibition campaigns in American history. One of them is the prohibition campaign. You know, the one with the capital P. For a time, it made illegal the manufacture, transportation, and sale of alcohol. But before we delve into that story, let's take a look at a far less well-known prohibitionist movement that occurred alongside of it. The War on Cigarettes. That's right, the War on Cigarettes. Let's get started with some background. Now, smoking, it's always had its critics. Way back in 1603, as English noblemen were becoming enthusiastic tobacco smokers, King James I let it be known that he found the habit absolutely disgusting. Smoking, he said, was a custom loathsome to the eye, hateful to the nose, harmful to the brain, dangerous to the lungs, and in the black stinking fume thereof, nearest resembling the horrible Stygian smoke of the pit that is bottomless. Well, if you didn't get that last part about the horrible Stygian smoke, he's referring to the smoke and fire of hell. Well, despite the king's condemnation, smoking tobacco grew in popularity. Nearly 300 years later, Englishmen and their American cousins annually smoked, chewed, and sniffed enormous quantities of tobacco. Every now and then, some critic of smoking would condemn it from the pulpit or maybe from the editorial page, but these folks were generally ignored, basically dismissed as health fanatics or puritanical evangelicals. But that began to change in the 1880s with the emergence of a new, vigorous, and widespread anti-smoking movement that lasted all the way into the 1920s. Some of its supporters spoke out against all forms of tobacco, but the great majority focused on a relatively new product, the cigarette. In 1880, cigarettes accounted for less than 1% of tobacco sales in the U.S., Then two things happened that sent cigarette sales soaring through the roof. First, in 1880, a man named James A. Bonsack invented a mechanical cigarette-making machine. This allowed for the mass production of very inexpensive cigarettes. Then, soon thereafter, along came a guy named James B. Duke. He bought a Bonsack machine in 1885, and then he developed ingenious marketing schemes to popularize his cigarettes. By 1890, he garnered 40% of cigarette sales in the U.S. And those sales? Well, they were booming. They jumped from 500 million cigarettes sold in 1880 to 4 billion by 1895 to 16 billion by the eve of World War I. Despite these impressive numbers, cigarette sales still only accounted for a fraction of the overall tobacco market. Nonetheless, cigarette smoking drew an enormous amount of criticism and over time, steadily escalating calls for its outright prohibition. By far the most prominent figure in the anti-cigarette crusade was Lucy P. Gaston of Chicago. In 1890, she established the Anti-Cigarette League of America. This organization marshaled three main arguments against cigarettes. First, they condemned the cigarette as culturally unsuitable for Americans. Cigarettes were symbols of the frivolous, effeminate, and foreign lifestyle of Europeans. To prove it, 
Critics pointed to the fact that cigarettes were really popular among recently arrived immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe. Picking up on this theme, the editors of the New York Times argued in 1884 that, quote, the decadence of Spain began when Spaniards adopted cigarettes. And the editors continued, quote, if this pernicious practice obtains among adult Americans, the ruin of the Republic is close at hand. That's right. Cigarette smoking, according to them, threatened to destroy America. The second concern of prohibitionists was that cigarettes were uniquely tempting to working-class boys. In part, this was because cigarettes were so cheap, basically five cents for a pack of ten. Cigarettes were also small, mild, and they could be smoked very quickly. Prohibitionists argued that the cigarette habit was, to use a modern phrase, a gateway vice that set young boys on the road to a life of intemperance and addiction. One newspaper editor warned, quote, Where boys drink to excess, they are almost invariably smokers, and it is rare to find a man overfond of spirits who is not addicted to tobacco. These critics called smokers cigarette fiends. Eventually, they argued that the cigarette led smokers to a life of crime. According to a New York City Board of Education official, quote, the cigarette fiend in time becomes a liar and a thief. He will commit petty thefts to get money to feed his insatiable appetite for nicotine. This notion of a cigarette peril was popularized by the tabloid press. The New York Telegram, for example, informed its readers in a typical notice, quote, Charles Burton, age 17, is to be hanged for murder. He was a cigarette fiend. Cigarette prohibitionists also condemned cigarettes for their popularity among women. They argued that young women, like boys, were susceptible to the allure of cigarettes, which quickly would draw them into a world of vice. As one newspaper editor put it, the practice of cigarette smoking among ladies seems to be generally regarded as the usual accompaniment, or prelude to, immorality. Clearly, this concern had less to do with the alleged pernicious qualities of cigarettes and a lot more to do with the growing independence of women in the early 20th century. The poster child for this trend was, of course, President Theodore Roosevelt's daughter Alice, who defiantly challenged many social conventions. Most notably, she smoked cigarettes in public. Well, this anti-cigarette crusade achieved a remarkable degree of success in the first decade of the 20th century. Hundreds of thousands of people joined the cause, including Thomas Edison and Henry Ford. Both men declared publicly that they would never hire cigarette smokers. By 1910, 15 states had banned the manufacture, sale, and use of cigarettes. It seemed to Lucy Gaston and her supporters in the Anti-Cigarette League that they were on the verge of achieving a national ban on cigarettes, maybe even before the parallel prohibition movement that was happening at the same time, the effort to ban alcohol. But their optimism proved ill-founded, and the anti-cigarette crusade soon went up in smoke. Cigarette sales continued to rise, and by 1915, the cigarette was increasingly viewed as a mainstream tobacco product. The cigarette achieved complete legitimation during World War I. American military officials were concerned about preserving the morality of American servicemen who were heading over to what they considered to be a decadent Europe. So they decided that providing American doughboys with a small vice like cigarettes would keep them occupied, and more importantly, out of French saloons and French brothels. So, in addition to calling upon Americans to buy liberty bonds to finance the war, public officials also urged them to donate cigarettes to the boys in France. And donate they did, to the tune of billions of cigarettes. By the end of the war, cigarettes, which were once thought of as subversive, foreign, effeminate, they became synonymous with manliness, patriotism, and stylishness. The anti-cigarette crusade was finished. By 1920, cigarette sales hit $45 billion and they'd continue to rise for another six decades. But while cigarette sales soared in 1920, alcohol sales, they ceased altogether. The parallel movement to ban alcohol had succeeded in gaining passage of the 18th Amendment to the Constitution, and that banned, quote, the manufacture, sale, or transportation of intoxicating liquors. The period known as Prohibition, yep, the one with the capital P, had begun. As we will learn in our next segment, it would be a period in which all Americans lost the freedom to enjoy a beer, a glass of wine, or a shot of whiskey. But for some Americans, in particular poor whites, African Americans and immigrants, prohibition meant the loss of a far greater array of freedoms. Like we said at the outset, freedom isn't free, but it is complicated. Stay tuned, people. You are listening to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. 
If you are enjoying this podcast, then please subscribe to In the Past Lane at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you access your podcasts. Subscribing is free, and once you do it, new episodes of In the Past Lane are automatically downloaded to your listening device. Subscribing also gives you access to the entire back catalog of In the Past Lane episodes. And if you do subscribe, please leave a review. Thanks. Welcome back to In the Past Lane. I'm here now with Professor Lisa McGurr, author of The War on Alcohol, Prohibition, and the Rise of the American State. Thank you for being with us today, Lisa. Thank you so much for having me, Ed. So why Prohibition? It's such an Mm -hmm. interesting topic. And, you know, when I first heard that you were working on this book and then now seen the book and had a chance to read it, it does seem to neatly fit into the work you're doing. But in some ways, you seem to be moving backwards in time. Your first book was Suburban Warriors about post-war America and the rise of the conservative movement. And this actually sort of fits neatly in behind it, if it was a Mm -hmm. sort of historical bookshelf. Yeah. So how'd you settle on Prohibition? Well, it wasn't so logical that I thought it would fit the way it did. But I think I was interested after Suburban Warriors and looking at an earlier moment in U.S. history where I felt that the right had had a lot of power. So the 20s seemed like a logical moment for that, Mm -hmm. you know, with the Scopes trial, with the height of nativism. And I actually first looked into the Sacco and Zetti case. And, oh. and I was interested in writing a book on that. And I wrote a couple of articles. But as I was looking at the Sacco and Zetti case and anti-immigrant sentiment, it became quite clear that prohibition was serving as a backdrop to right. the period. Mm-hmm. But we did not have a lot of good, rich history on prohibition itself. We had a lot of good work on how we got to prohibition. Right. So historians had told us a lot about the temperance movement. But once you got to 1920, Mm. from 1920 to 1933, the extent of the literature dropped off. It was replaced by more sensationalist accounts. Yeah, pop culture. Yes. Speakeasies, bootleg gin, the lots of stories of organized crime, narratives that were relatively sensationalist and didn't have Mm. a lot of analysis. So it was pretty clear there was a big space to be filled. I thought there was probably a lot more there, and it proved to be the case. It's interesting to think about how we think about prohibition. Mm -hmm. It does seem to be a period of sort of inexplicable Puritan success. Mm -hmm. uh, And then on the one hand, and then thank goodness we got over that, almost like a bad moment in one's life. One of America's sort of wig out moments, and it's so out of the ordinary and so completely disconnected to what happened before and what happened afterward. And then it ended sometime in 1933. That's uh, one way people think about it. And then the other way is, like you're saying, the, the Jay Gatsby, Babe Ruth, New York City, jazz, speakeasies. It's an exciting time. It's a cool, super cool time. And I think what your book does a great job of getting beyond both those ideas. Yes. So, I mean, that's the way that we tended to have thought about this period was, yeah, A, overwhelmingly, this was a huge failure, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the overwhelming way historians have thought about it. I think that's part of the reason there's sort of a sense of the inevitability that it would fail, the sense that this was just hugely overambitious and impossible. And so we've Mm -hmm. emphasized both the way it wasn't enforced as well as its many failings. But that's caused us, I think, to neglect the many ways in which this set the stage for developments that continued after, the way the very attempt contributed to particular forms of state building. And yes, what we've overwhelmingly emphasized is the lack of observance, Mm. the speakeasies, the organized supply rings, which are not inaccurate. It's just a very partial portrait of the era. And so my book tries to look at the excavate kind of the other side, what we haven't known, what we haven't seen about the period. Right. I think a lot of people would be surprised if you said to them, what do you know about the connection between the Klan Mm -hmm. and Prohibition? People say, well, I don't think of them as having anything to do with each other. But clearly, the Klan becomes a big enforcer in some states like Indiana. Yes, absolutely. The Klan was attractive and grew and emerged in evangelical white Protestant areas. And it sold itself to many of these white evangelical citizens who had been important in getting the 18th Amendment, the Volstead Act, passed as a law enforcement organization, Mm -hmm. right? So there was a huge crisis of law observance. There were lots of violators. And those who were publicly identified with doing so happened to be largely immigrants and Catholics, those who were already enemies of the Klan, right? So the Klan was able to utilize the law instrumentally 
to bolster its ranks, to sell itself as a kind of law enforcement organization to these white evangelical Protestants who were already anxious about a host of changes coming out of World War I. And the Volstead Act and that lack of observance brought together or crystallized all those anxieties about right. these other social changes, yes. whether it's African-American militancy, changing gender roles, and the lack of observance, and the subterranean world of nightlife leisure, right, around prohibition, which right. was more racially mixed, which was more permissive. So this really helped to spark the incredible growth of the Klan in this time period. Yeah, the statistics are staggering. The number you often see is that there are 5 million members by 1924, mm -hmm. 25. And the second element that's staggering for a lot of people is how much of it's concentrated in the North. It's not Alabama. It's Alabama, but it's also Indiana. It's also yes. Ohio. It's also parts of central Massachusetts. It's really striking how, mm -hmm. how far and wide the reach is. Right. In contrast to the first clan, which was really deeply Southern, this had a far more reach both in the Midwest and in the Far West. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so who else makes up this coalition? Because prohibition is not some secret thing that's cooked up by a handful of people in Washington. You know, it comes out, it's really a grassroots movement. Yeah. So who else is part of this very diverse coalition? Well, you have to remember that the movement itself for prohibition comes out of the longer and deeper temperance roots of the 19th century. So by the late 19th century, you have organizations like the Women's Christians Temperance Union, a grassroots, huge organization of largely white, largely white, but also interracial in some parts of the North, Protestant organization, which was very much chapter based. So it was deeply grassroots. And then the Anti-Saloon League, which called itself the Protestant Church in Action around <laughs> yes. the saloon. And with just, again, another one of these organizations that comes out of nowhere and then just boom, it has this vast reach across the country, huge membership and influence. And huge influence because it's, you know, the Protestant Church is everywhere, right? It has roots in rural America, can penetrate into every community. So even though it's not grassroots, it's, it's top down, it's nonetheless able to penetrate really, really widely and have a very strong influence. But those are the two, the militant core of the movement, right. right? The movement, though, as you mentioned already, is far wider in its reach. And that's what enables the 18th Amendment Volstead Act to be put over the top. That is that it gains a lot of support during the progressive era. And among those who think of themselves as progressive men and women in urban city centers that are concerned about the problems of mass poverty, the problems of dependent women and children, of laboring classes. Domestic violence. Uh, Domestic things. violence, yeah. right. The sort of, you know, trying to improve the conditions of laboring men and women. And the saloon and the drink traffic, they target as a way of exploiting working class men and women. And they see it as kind of, for many, as a kind of panacea. Let's get rid of this exploitive drink traffic and the saloon in order to improve the lives of laboring men and women. Right. So it's a broad coalition at a time when many reformers are turning to the state and the federal government increasingly to resolve social and economic problems. Right. So it's interesting. We're good on the Puritan side, but the progressive side might surprise people that some of the impulse really was pro capital P progressive saying, if we do this, if we make it harder to drink, more expensive to drink, this will allow the average person who's ensnared in this kind of network of uh, alcohol addiction to save a few more pennies. In some ways, it's happening at the same time with all this social turmoil. So mm -hmm. one question is, do we need a minimum wage? Do we need more empowerment of labor? And some say, well, no, 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 let's not go there. That's very dangerous. How about we work around in a different angle that we can allow the working classes to rise by sobering them up and save, Absolutely. Them save but it's definitely a more an easier response for these kind of respectable Protestant yep. middle class women and women to identify that issue as the core or the crux of the problem rather than other more redistributionist issues or mm -hmm. issues that would involve changes in power relations. Which were very much on the table. You know, yes. Deb, Debs and the socialist movement are, are at their height in these very years, lead the de two decades leading into Croatia. That's right. And so this is a way of trying to work at these issues from, as you said, another angle, which is less threatening, let's mm -hmm. say, for many of these uh, men and women. But what's interesting, what you also said about this, you know, identifying as progressive, is this is an issue which one cannot think of in traditional left-right terms, mm -hmm. right? Conservatives, William Howard Taft, for example, w was totally opposed to prohibition mm -hmm. for the very reason that of expanding the state. So you had, it's not like a conservatives supported prohibition. In fact, you know, conservatives, those who thought of themselves as conservatives often opposed it, even though they were thought alcohol was a danger and a threat to the white race, for example. 
One question about what is it about the saloon? This is another thing when you get down to a closer level on prohibition, you realize that it's not just alcohol. It's actually the physical place yeah. in some ways because saloons are in cities. The leading prohibitionist movement is called the Anti-Saloon League. Exactly. Yeah, so so rather there's something than, about that space. Yes. Yeah, so rather than targeting personal drink consumption, prohibitionists targeted the traffic and mm. particularly, as you said, the traffic within the saloon. The saloon was not just a space, but it was for these men and women political space. So it was largely identified with urban areas and, of course, with immigrants. And it was in some ways thought of as a kind of working man's club. It was also the lowest rung of politics for Democratic and Republican Party. And so for progressive men and women who were deeply opposed to what they saw as the corruption of these urban machines and machine politics, they targeted the saloon. Yeah, and it's also at the very same time, there's the anti-dance hall movement, there's the anti-pool hall movement. So there's Mm -hmm. a lot of these immoral spaces, but there's something special about the saloon. I came across quite by accident a Budweiser ad from June of 1904. And yeah. it caught my attention because it said, Budweiser, the true temperance beer. And I said, I, well, I'm very curious about a temperance beer. And <laughs> long and the short of it was, their claim was 80% of Budweiser is consumed in the home. Uh, and so, so I was able to f- was realizing they were basically saying it's not a saloon beer. Right. So beer is not bad. Saloon beer is bad. If it's consumed in the right way and in the, in the secure home, then it's, a, then it's fine. And of course, you know, in the wake of prohibition, right, the, even those very staunch anti-prohibitionists like Roosevelt eventually, who mm-hmm. comes on board, argues that we will return, we will have repeal, but we will never allow the return of the saloon. So even yeah. at that point, there's a sort of embrace and acceptance of alcohol as part of middle class leisure, but in a very different way. There's a sort of acknowledgement that, you know what, we did manage to get rid of the saloon, but with prohibition, and we're not going to allow the return of it. And there's an increasing, of course, drink does increasingly move into the home in the wake of prohibition. So there is a kind of change that comes along with it. What about the targets? So we've talked about the who's behind it, but the the impact on the ground for these immigrants, for these increasingly oppressed African Americans in Mm -hmm. the South. Talk a little bit about how prohibition really has a major impact on their lives. This is not speakeasies in jazz. Right. Uh, This is something quite different. And and, and has that repercussions, really the part of your book title where you say the rise of the state. Mm -hmm. And even though prohibitions repealed in 1933, the impact of prohibition lingers right up to the very moment that we're talking right now. Well, so there's two facets to that I would emphasize in answering your question. One is that the impact on poor men and women. So we often think of the lack of enforcement, but as I mentioned already, right, prohibition was enforced, but the reality was it was very selectively enforced mm. and particular groups were targeted, often groups that were already identified in public discourse with criminality. Where and how it was enforced differed across the nation. So in honing in at the local level, you can really look at the way it was enforced differently by region, by class, and by race and ethnicity. And in places like, for example, in Richmond, Virginia, it was poor men and women and African Americans that were disproportionately targeted. In cities like Chicago, it was immigrant ethnic working class men and women. In places like Southern Illinois, which is one of the places I talk about in the book, it was largely Italians and Catholics. And that's where you really see the Klan operating as an enforcement organization. So it's logical in a way, because there were criminal rings that were trying to satisfy the thirst of Americans Mm -hmm. successfully for drink. They, and the extent to which those groups were, because of the profits involved, were able to smooth their operations up and down the enforcement chain, Mm -hmm. right, by payoffs and corruption, the logical targets then for government enforcement that had to at least try to enforce was to target those groups who were less protected, who could not pay protection costs, poor, marginal violators. So those were the ones that ended up often in police casebooks. Those are the ones that were increasingly filling the nation's prisons. The growing number of prisons, right? Growing number yeah. of prisons, right. But because this problem of there's these continued criminal rings... There's increasing obsession over crime and criminality and the lack of observance. So in the 20s, the government increasingly is continually trying to enforce what is seemingly unenforceable. And as a result, there is a kind of doubling down by the late 20s on enforcement. And the very attempt leads to whole new ways of muscling government agencies, expanding policing structures, surveillance, new forms of criminal knowledge. So this is the moment, of course, in 1930, where you get the uniform crime reports. 
It's the moment when we have the expansion of the Bureau of Prisons into the Federal Bureau of Prisons. It's the moment in the expansion of the numbers of federal prisons and also the expansion in incarcerated numbers at the state level. So it's also the moment, of course, where we get the increasing authority of the FBI by the 1930s right. coming directly off of prohibition. Yeah, the 10 most wanted and all that, right? And the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, which is mm-hmm. directly linking to your point about the continuities until today. This is the birthing, the moment of the birthing of our penal and punitive approach toward other narcotic drugs. And that, of course, doesn't end with repeal, right? It just, the sort of the effort to target recreational substances, psychoactive substances, moves into a different orientation Mm. toward other forms of narcotic drugs. And that comes directly out of alcohol prohibition. Once you had the targeting of one recreational substance with a penal approach, it's logical to target even more forcefully other substances that are thought of as more dangerous than alcohol. Right. I mean, prohibition's repealed in 33, and it's right at that moment that marijuana, which isn't Mm -hmm. even called marijuana, they actually give it the name marijuana to make it sound foreign and threatening, is precisely in that within within just a few years, the anti-marijuana movement really gains a lot of traction, and then it just continues on up to the present day. So in some ways, prohibition is the first war on drugs. Absolutely. You can really see that as a kind of first iteration of a kind of or dress rehearsal for a war on drugs, a different war on drugs that moves in a different direction after alcohol prohibition. But it's precisely right. It's in 1937 that we get the first anti-marijuana legislation at the federal level. It's in the 1920s that you get the beefing up of the anti-narcotics enforcement apparatus and new drug legislation. And of course, it's the moment where we have the first national drug czar, Harry Anslinger, who's active right up through the 60s until really the second, what we can think about is the second war on drugs. So it's a troubling continuity. Some continuities are welcome, some are are not. And in fact, in some ways, it's an escalating continuity. Uh, Mm -hmm. Although in the last two or three years, you've heard more talk about changing sentencing laws, including from get tough on crime red states, Texas, for example, and others have said, much as our political culture says, hammer them, lawbreakers and drug dealers, it doesn't make any sense fiscally. Yeah. So let's, let's begin to rethink this, if not from a humanitarian and civil liberty standpoint, from an economic standpoint. So. Absolutely. So you've got a really strange set of bedfellows, mm-hmm. interestingly enough, once again, as we did during alcohol prohibition and its repeal. At this very moment, with the groups like the Koch brothers linking up to progressive groups that are concerned about justice within the criminal system and the numbers of incarcerated together, questioning and challenging for the first time, really, the war on drugs, which we've had for about 40 years ongoing now. Well, this has been very interesting. Do you have anything you want to you feel like we've left out? You know, I mean, basically, the book is really an effort to hone in on these low on the local level and tell a story of prohibition from the bottom up. It's kind of social history perspective, which I know you very much share. And I think that is what becomes so rich about that portrait. What changes our portrait is precisely using the angle of social history. And so it just shows the kind of richness of what one can do with the social history methodology, I think. Right. If you're choosing wisely these case studies or these focus points of, you know, where you can bring more of the historical record to life and to see human beings and how it affects people And to directly. understand what it meant for ordinary men and women, yeah. not for the few men and women who were the avant-garde within mm. the speakeasies, which right. is very real, but was ramified in popular culture because of mass media. And those other right. stories have been less told. Well, I want to thank you, Lisa McGurr, for taking the time to talk to us about your book. It's a great book. It's not only covers a really crucial point in American history, but it's really well written. It's got that good mix of political narrative, but also those, like you said, social history, a good blend of the two. Thank you so much, Ed. I appreciate your talking with me. All right. Thank you. Lisa McGurr is professor of history at Harvard University. She is the author of several books, most recently, The War on Alcohol, Prohibition and the Rise of the American State. You can learn more about Lisa McGurr and her work at our website, inthepastlane.com. Look for the show page for episode number three. Well, people, as always, this has been a lot of fun, but I'm afraid we are out of time. 
I want to thank you for listening. And I want to hear from you. So send along your comments, questions, and suggestions via Facebook and Twitter. I also encourage you to visit our website, inthepastlane.com. At this site, you'll find a show page for this episode that includes show notes, links, essays, images, and further reading suggestions related to all the stuff we've talked about in this episode. It also includes more information about our guests, correspondents, and other contributors. It's all there at inthepastlane.com. And please, subscribe to the In the Past Lane podcast at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you access your podcasts. And when you do, please leave a starred review and a comment. It really helps. Thanks. And don't forget, you can catch Megan Kate Nelson's insightful review and commentary about the latest episode of PBS's Mercy Street in our Mercy Street Rewind feature. To avoid spoilers, Mercy Street Rewind appears as a separate segment in this podcast feed. In the Past Lane has been made possible by the hard work and dedication of many people. They include technical advisors Holly Hunt and Jesse Anderson, podcasting consultant Daryl Darnell of Pro Podcast Solutions, photographer John Buckingham, graphic designer Maggie Salucci, website by ERI Design, legal services Tippa Canoe and Tyler Two, social media management The Pony Express, risk assessment Little Bighorn Associates, growth strategies 54, 40, or fight. And of course, there'd be no In the Past Lane podcast without our executive producer, Lulu Spencer. Special thanks also to Jay Graham for creating the intro music for this podcast and to the Free Music Archive for providing the rest of the music for this episode. I'm In the Past Lane's host, Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, reminding you that history explains our world. So let's pay attention to it. Thanks for listening. We hope you'll join us next time for another journey in the past lane. Lulu, you get the last word. Go. Who listens to this thing anyway? SBI, Snoring Beagle International.